Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, we will start in a minute or two. Um, you know, on Wednesday evenings we have our science news where we discuss, uh, you know, science articles that came out, new studies, and uh, we read them together. We discuss them a little bit. If you want to take a real deep dive, we'll try to invite the scientists that did these studies. And then they'll come as speakers later on and share uh, their research with us. So, yeah, feel free to share, to come up to the stage. This is more kind of a round table discussion. And, um, yeah, we're happy to have you. Billy, come up. Kiko, do you want to come up? Hi, Lady Rocket. Haven't seen you in a while. Hi, Billy. How are you? Hey, hey. Hello, everyone. Katarina, you got a 145 IQ, you figure? Uh, well, I got tested one time. I'm not sure how accurate it was. but What they say for you? Yeah, I think it was something around that. I believe it. You are so smart. <laughs> but I don't know. It was a really long time ago. <laughs> and I don't know how accurate that was. They kind of... Testing. How about these new flutes? I'm reading this article. Yeah, Victoria shared this article wow. with us. So. That's incredible, yeah, so we're right? Gonna, we're going to get into that. Hi, Billy. Nice to see you. Hi, Kirko. How are Thank you, you doing? Glad to have you here. I'm just, uh, just situating myself. And let's get... Um, yeah, we can get moving into this one. This is really amazing. So, uh, I'm ready to go, and glad to have um, the guests who are here. Great to see you, too. And I'm just closing all the pop-ups on my screen. Katarina, I see exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> Certain websites do that. So, um, yeah, Billy, thanks for starting us off. So we're going to be hearing about 12,000-year-old flutes that mimic the sound of prehistoric birds. And this is from um, an article, a science article that was published in the journal Scientific Reports, and Smithsonian has shared their version of it. They're talking about scientists in Israel who have discovered seven of these 12,000-year-old flutes. And they're made from tiny bird bones. The instruments were likely designed to imitate the calls of birds of prey. They were among a collection of 1,100 bird bones that were unearthed during previous excavations at an archaeological site in Israel's Hula Valley. During a recent examination of the artifacts, scientists noticed that seven had unique features, such as finger holes and mouthpieces, that would have allowed them to function as musical instruments. And I'm going to, um, after I read this, I'll place the link for the, the scientific journal in the chat, because there are also a lot of really interesting photographs that you can see that the scientists were, were looking at to come to these conclusions. So that continues. These flutes, or aerophones, which means wind instrument, are some of the oldest known instruments that imitate bird calls. While older bone flutes have been found elsewhere, they're quite rare. This discovery marks the first time a prehistoric sound instrument from the Near East has been identified, according to a statement from Virginia Commonwealth University. They all show microscopic use wear, indicating they were in fact used or played, says author Tal Simmons, who is a forensic anthropologist at the university in the statement. They're also really unique because the sound they produce is very similar to that of two specific birds of prey that were hunted by the people living at the site where they were discovered, which are the kestrel and the sparrowhawk. To learn more, the researchers created replica versions of the flutes, which they were able to play themselves. And I think that just that's such an exciting idea. 
Uh, the article continues. It was very moving when I played it for the first time and heard the sound that Natufians played made 12,000 years ago, says lead author Laurent Davine, an archaeologist at the French Research Institute in Jerusalem. And this was reported to Live Sciences' Jennifer Nalewicki. The remnants of the seven flutes, including one complete instrument, were the work of the Natufians who lived in the Levant region. And the Levant region, just to interrupt this, it's a, it's a geographic term that refers to a huge area in, in the Eastern Mediterranean region of Western Asia. So it could include Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and adjacent areas. And an interesting thing, I think, is that the term Levant, it comes from French, lever, which means to rise, and before that, Latin, levare, but because the sun rises in the east, and so this was because of the, um, where people were situating themselves to, to name areas on maps, this area was determined to be the east, and so therefore it's called the Levant, or the rising area. So, and the, they're referring to the people, the, the Natufians, and those are people in the late Mesolithic Mideast, and they, um, they were, they had specific, um, specific things that they developed that, that are um, typical to them. But, but going back to this article, the remnants of the seven flutes, including one complete instrument, were the work of the Natufians who lived in the Levant region between 13,000 and 9,700 BCE. And they transitioned over time from foraging to agriculture, becoming the first group in the region to adopt a sedentary lifestyle, uh, as explained by Discover Magazine's Sam Walters. Thanks to their discovery, researchers have a new opportunity to learn more about life during this transition time, says study author Rivka Rabinowicz, an archaeozoologist at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, to the Times of Israel's Melanie Lidman. This article is doing a fantastic job of citing authorship. I love that. It's a very exciting period at which to understand the day-to-day -day life and also larger questions beyond day-to-day -day life, she adds. The artifacts can offer insight to the Natufians' relationship to birds of prey and the role of music in their culture. The craftsmanship of the flutes, which were likely painted and worn on a string around the neck, shows sophistication <coughs> and technical precision. The Natufians picked small wing bones from the Eurasian teal and Eurasian coot to best mimic the sound of birds n of prey native to the area. So that's interesting, <coughs> excuse me, because the teal and the coot, those are water birds. They're like ducks, and they're, they look nothing like the birds of prey whose sound they are used to mimic. And and the and ducks and teals and ducks, the kind of teals and coots have a really different sound. But um, the uh, the article continues. The uh, Natufians chose those small bones because they wanted the sound to be like this in order to imitate falcon sounds, says Davine to Live Science. This demonstrates their knowledge of acoustics and indicates that they were probably other instruments made of perishable materials. The flutes may have been used in hunting to lure birds so they could be caught, making the instruments the earliest evidence of the use of sound in hunting, says study author Hamudi Kalaili. That's a really sweet name because Hamudi in Hebrew means dear one. Um, a senior researcher with the Israel Antiquities Authority to Haaretz's Ruth Schuster. Still, the flutes could have been used for other purposes. Playing them may also have been an attempt to spiritually commune or communicate with these birds of prey, says Simmons in the statement. They were important to Natufian and earlier cultures in the Levant. These may have been worn by the prehistoric people as ritual jewelry and may even have been totem animals. This fall, Kalaili plans to return to the excavation site during the annual bird migration period and test out a replica flute. I'm naturally an optimistic person, but I do really think it will work, he tells the Times of Israel. If we were to be able to replicate this sound, 
I'm certain, I'm certain it will bring those birds to us. And they have here, and I play this, they have this, this is the sound produced by the Natufian aerophone. These are, um, that were created, the replicas. So here's how it sounds. I hope you can hear this. Yeah, thank you so much. This kind of a deep uh, noise, like a really uncomfortable noise. Oh, I'm know. sorry. <laughs> yeah, thanks for letting me. <laughs> it is. It is like really screechy, and you can hear the person yeah. breathing. Yeah. Yeah. So that is the article. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. This was really interesting. I I I can imagine that they were really moved, and I kind of would like to hear. You know, but the sound is really, I don't know if it's just because it's through headphones or something, because I'm wearing my headphones. That's, oh, no, uh, it was an annoying sound, but it's, um, I have a high <laughs> tolerance for annoying sounds. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I kind yeah. of thought, oh, I would love to hear the noise, the sound, but then I yeah, thought, oh no, my god, it. It, it hurts my ears. But all good. It's still very yeah, interesting, it's like, it's amazing that you, we can, ref like, Thanks to this discovery, we can replicate. Well, I think it proves that if someone were, that you aren't a bird of prey, you're not a kestrel or, or one of the other birds that they were trying to attract by using that sound because you would cover your ears and run the other way. Yeah, it's interesting to me. Do you think, but well, you know, I think can everyone could everyone hear that sound in an annoying way, or did somebody think, oh, it's kind of fine, because there's a range that it. some people can hear. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. It sounds like different than regular birds, huh? They're like like since they're like older birds, they're like evolution and stuff was different. They're like it like sounds different, you know, to me than regular birds. You know, it reminds me more of like mice and rats that have this. Yes, it's very interesting. Yes. Range. Yeah. Well, that's typical of birds of prey. So I don't, I don't know if you've heard the screeching of birds of prey, but a, a most birds of prey. Oh, like an eagle or a hawk. They are. They sound like a little baby bird. They sound, They have a very high pitched squeal. It doesn't sound at all like I would have thought if I was going to say what a bird of prey would sound like. I would think they would sound ferocious, but there's a like uh, that. Yeah, I agree. And so, Kirk I would have said the opposite. Instead of like it sounded like a bird of prey, it sounds like it's like meant to confuse a bird. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I feel like it, that really kind of hurt my head a little bit. So, like, I can only imagine like what it would feel like for a bird. It probably like kind of dazzle it or something. Oh, that's really an interesting viewpoint right yeah because we don't know this is an assumption it's an absolute assumption that the, it was a bird call to be an attractant but it yeah we don't know what their um what their hunting strategy was so it could be that they're they're near to the bird and you know exactly as you're saying that they're trying to distract that's fantastic yeah thank you Kirka. welcome lady rocket Thank you, thank you. I I am delighted uh, to join you and want to acknowledge uh, Katarina's beautiful stewardship of such an important role and uh, staying, keeping us and helping us uh, learn so many incredible things. And uh, thank you for the article. It's absolutely amazing, unexpected. And uh, when I was uh, listening to, to the sounds that you shared with us, I am, by the way, in Malibu, not too far away from Zuma Beach. And I don't know if, uh, if birds here heard your sound, but suddenly I started to hear birds around me. Some kind of birds started to fly. I don't know if it was accidental. Um, I just want to, thank you, Lady Rocket. That's really interesting. Yeah, maybe. We don't, we don't know, you know, when you, 
we don't know what the language is conveying. But Billy, those are replicas. So they made replicas, and that sound that we heard was a replica because I see you put in the chat that you hope they wash the flutes before they put their mouths on them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I was just texting with Katerina and uh, just briefly, I am a, a co-founder of the space company called Copernic Space. Um, and uh, we have capacity and we made arrangement with the uh, rockets going to the moon to send to the moon as a private, privately funded venture, some of it's profitable, but send to the moon things that represent something priceless on planet Earth. And uh, I am developing successfully a, a project of sending bees sounds to the moon as a digital file, as a, as a philanthropic project to help us uh, fundraise millions of dollars to save bees. But you just inspired me. And I want to ask you, before I have to take off, if you were to choose birds sound, that we should send to the moon to represent us and planet Earth, I wonder what bird would you choose? And this is a serious question because you just inspired me to add to my list of the cargo sound of the, the sound of the bird. Yeah, I have an answer. I okay. Have an answer um, because it just came right to mind. So the mockingbird or, or another such bird that's capable of copying all the sounds that it huh. hears, you know, because mockingbirds, they'll they'll play, and there are other birds who who are really great at mim this kind of sound mimicry. But you know, if they hear a buzz saw or a washing machine or a car starting, so it's not only you know aesthetically pleasing sounds, but it's all sounds, and they incorporate those into their bird song. So I, a, I would suggest a bird like that because it would carry. Victoria, that. this is a very very inspiration and very attractive suggestion and what I'm going to do and follow me but I'm going to sponsor and ask my artist to create we call it a utility NFT because I also have the largest space science and art digital platform called Spaceables where artists create images of uh, space earth uh, I will ask my artist to create hummingbird NFT and mention you in it uh, as a first step. And what we do is we use some of the NFTs to uh, let people participate in the project because you know to send something to the moon is of course immensely expensive. But we broke the barriers of the economic, uh, you know, price. But also using blockchain and using. Uh, smart contract we can tokenize fractionalize which means if we can as a as a group of people own the sound send it send it to the moon once it there unleash so-called fractionalization which means people who want to can buy piece of the of the sound on the moon for the philanthropic cause or for a profit so this is a way we are trying to democratize space uh, for those who want to be philanthropists, we have that. But those who want to treat it as an upside opportunity, we have that. But hummingbird sounds terrific. I did actually say mockingbird. But oh, thank I you for everything. Yeah, mockingbird. Humming, hummingbird. Hummingbird has a completely, that sound. Uh, the this sound of mockingbird. mockingbird, yeah. Because the Not hummingbird bad, sounds yes. is, is, is like a little electronic, strange little twang sound <laughs> that they make. But yeah, thank you for all that you're sharing. Yes, because we have to redo the way science is financed. And we have to redo who owns the results of the science and how it can be implemented to benefit Earth uh, independently of existing massive uh, foundations or even universities because it goes way too slow and the processes still rely on the old processes and without usage of the innovative technologies like blockchain which was not created to create a Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. This is peripheral, completely small application of blockchain. Blockchain allows us humans to decide what it is that is interesting to us of value 
and have ability to share it. So this is what we are building for sharing opportunities in space for all of us. So Mockingbirds it is. Stay in touch and I will have probably an NFT like in two or three days. Great to see you as always. Great to see you, Lady Rocket. Thank you. Thank you. Love your Malibu. Thank you so much. Enjoy. And yeah, I'm looking forward to see it. Thank you for sharing with us. Yes. This was a great... Sorry, I have to take off, but love and thank you for keeping this beautiful, beautiful room going. Yes, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we appreciate it. And My pleasure. My big pleasure. Good luck for everything. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Victoria. <laughs> that was really a wonderful exchange and I'm really looking forward to that Mockingbird um, NFT. This will be... Uh, we will celebrate. <laughs> we will celebrate it here when it comes out. So thank you. I love that kind of serendipitous um connection that we make here in Clubhouse. So now, yeah, <laughs> are, are we ready for this one? I'm sure people have yep. been hearing about this. Okay. All right. So, okay. So the um, giant clumps of sargassum seaweed have been accumulating on um, coast of Florida. Now, giant clumps of the 13 million ton morass labeled the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt are washing up on Florida's beaches and scientists are warning of a real life threat from the piles of decomposing algae, namely high levels of the flesh-eating bacteria, flesh-eating Vibrio bacteria lurking in the ve vegetation. Just to back up a little bit, I'm, I imagine that people know that there's been a lot of the, the algae called sargassum washing up on Florida beaches. And people don't really know why there's been such a, such a bloom of it. And a tiny bit of background of sargassum is that there's, there's a place called the Sargasso Sea and it's, it is the only sea or space that's, that um, we title a sea that has no land boundaries. And it has a species of sargassum of this kind of algae that grows there. It floats freely and it serves as a, it, it, it's a really useful place. It serves as nurseries and habitat and spawning ground for so many different marine animals, um, you know, both birds and pelagic creatures, and and it can it can um, propagate itself. Just it doesn't. It can propagate itself while it's free floating. So it's a type of seaweed that doesn't need to have a um, an attached sessile part of its life cycle. It can it can regenerate from certain structures that it can grow and also just from a piece of a parent organism it can it can regrow itself so it's it's pretty darn successful and so here it comes floating up on the coast of Florida and so now um, scientists have noticed this alarming discovery um, was made by marine biologists at Florida Atlantic University and it lends a dangerous new aspect to the brown seaweed onslaught, which is already threatening to spoil the state's busy summer tourist season as coatings of decaying goop exude a pungent aroma akin to that of rotting eggs. Even more worrying, researchers say, is the role of ocean pollution in the proliferation of the bacteria, which can cause disease and death if a person is infected. Samples tested from the Caribbean and the Sargasso Sea itself within the Atlantic were abundant with plastic debris which interacted with the algae and bacteria to create a perfect pathogen storm with implications for both marine life and public health. Our lab shows that these vibrio, that's the name of the bacteria, are extremely aggressive and can seek out and stick to plastic within minutes, says Tracy Mincer, assistant professor of biology at FAU's Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute and Harriet L. Wilkes Honors College. 
He said, the seaweed belt stretching from the Gulf of Mexico to the African coast provided the perfect breeding ground for omnivorous strains of the bacteria that target both plant and animal life and associated microbial flora potentially harboring poten potent levels of pathogens. We really want to make the public aware of these associated risks. In particular, caution should be exercised regarding the harvest and processing of sargassum biomass until the risks are explored more, th more thoroughly, he said. This has become a worry for many, from municipal crews charged with clearing the washed up seaweed from Florida's beaches to make them more attractive for vacationers, to tourists themselves and teams of environmentally conscious volunteers who fill trash sacks with washed up detritus. It's very alarming in the first place to see it on the beaches and alarming to see the plastic that it is entangled with. And now, even more than that, there's harmful bacteria too. The group is hosting a beach cleanup. This part surprises me. The group is hosting a beach cleanup on Saturday to mark next week's World Ocean Day. And I, let me just back up because World Ocean Day was last. Okay, yeah, this is from the early June, but because, yeah, we already had World Ocean Day. Um, recruits will be taking precautions, including thick gloves, sanitizers, and long handled grabbers to avoid direct contact with the materials they remove. We will be paying extra attention and making sure everybody washes their hands, does not touch their faces after cleanup, but I wonder what happens if we ingest it or come in contact with it. Is it transferable? And when it rains, does it end up in our drinking water, Rigel said. Florida's Department of Health is advertising, advising residents and visitors to avoid sargassum and warns that Vibrio vulnificus infections can be severe for people with weakened immune systems, such as those with chronic liver disease. The state's Department of Environmental Protection says that it's working with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission and municipalities to monitor the seaweed belt and notes that the Florida legislature has budgeted $5 million to assist local governments with cleanup efforts. This is not a new phenomenon and many local governments, particularly in South Florida, are, experiencing, are experienced in managing it on their beaches and have already got management plans and necessary authorizations in place to respond said a DEP spokesperson, John Moore. We're ready to work with any impacted local government as well as expedite necessary authorizations so that cleanup activities can be conducted in an efficient and productive manner. Um, let's see. Uh, did you go ahead, Katarina? Yeah, I hope the people that help cleaning up uh, get like masks because I'm not sure if it's the same, because in France, in the Bretagne, um, they have the same issues. And then the, in the beginning, they just send people out to the beach uh, without any masks. It, it's for sure a different algae, but the decomposing of the algae, if it's a lot, they're very toxic gases that can build up. And once you start digging into them, you release them and then people died mm -hmm. uh, and friends uh, in the beginning. So mm -hmm. yeah, if somebody wants to help, I would, you know, at least get informed by it and, and you know, wear something protective. Well, yeah. Uh, to avoid breathing because, in those gases. Yeah, what you're too. saying is, yeah, in addition, because the, it, it really doesn't seem like it's enough. They're saying thick gloves, sanitizers, and long-handled grabbers. And they're dealing with flesh-eating bacteria, so there's and and a moist environment, so things could be splashing. You know, if you scratch yourself, and and as you're saying, toxic gases because this is decomposing. Masses of this are decomposing. It it really it doesn't sound like there are enough precautions being taken. And what I was wondering is if. You know, you're 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 mentioning this had happened in France, and and for governments to work together, and it, it reminds me of COVID. <laughs> you know, like what were the protocols and how they changed so quickly as as science recognized what was happening, and so what may happen here with this because this may become a, more of a norm. Yeah, it's it's just. I guess it's, you know, climate change with the high use of fertilizers, um, you know, not just for agriculture, but also for, you know, people on their lawns and so on. That combination just um, 
I guess it's the perfect mixture for algae to just grow a lot. Um, and yeah, this will probably be an issue. And it's then it's not just for the beach, then it's also for the whole ecosystem in the ocean that changes uh, quite significantly. So um, yeah, we'll see. And then what to do with the algae, because I would assume that you would have I don't know, if you just burn them, let them decompose, uh, it could be problematic maybe because you could have a lot of CO2 released through that, you know, whatever they calculate probably in what is a um, ocean as a CO2 dump, if you just um, let them rot like this or let them, you know, burn them will be problematic. So I guess this char um, procedure could maybe help or them in somewhere but then it could pollute the if it's highly contaminated it could pollute then the groundwater so and you have to find a place that is safe if it's, you know far away enough from groundwater that is being used for drinking water so there's a whole thing and I hope people think of all the consequences because, you know, we've seen this over and over. This happens, then they make a quick illusion, don't think about, let's say, the groundwater and drinking water close by. And then a lot of people, you know, get affected and to, to clean up the mess worth and thinking a few steps ahead before yeah and the thing about seaweed is that it breaks down really quickly because it's high in carbohydrates it's low in cellulose and then it's moist and warm so what i i was thinking is that it would be so fantastic if this could be used in a positive way somehow collected and used for plant fertilizer because it's already it's really high in trace minerals that plants need to grow so wouldn't it be so great if it could somehow be collected, decomposed, and then, you know, but then if it's got this, um, you know, flesh-eating bacteria, I don't know what, um, you know, in what circumstances that bacteria will thrive or, or be killed. But, but that would be another interesting thing that, that I was thinking of, you know, that we have this and how can it be is it possible to put it to good use because you don't have to go out and collect it? It's just, it's just, just right there. But um, you're also saying, talking about um, factors that increase the algal blooms, which this is one, and it's also you know detergents, phosphates in detergents, and there's so many things that go into and plus um, temperature change, and. Um, it's really a good environment for, for this marine algae to be growing, but yeah, it would be great if we could use it. And welcome, Joyce, glad to see you. Yeah, hi. Wow, I came in for the big blob. <laughs> <laughs> it was bird flutes before that, so. <laughs> I just wanna say thank you guys for ruining my beach plants for the summer. Oh. I'll clean it up for you. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Get on it. <laughs> Let's go to a to a to a positive one then, if you want, Victoria, to share the next one. Okay, here we go. Yeah, it's interesting. We've read so many of these and and just keep them coming you know it just proves that there is a way and um, here we go so clean sustainable fuels made from thin air and plastic waste researchers have demonstrated how carbon dioxide can be captured from industrial processes or even directly from the air and transformed into clean sustainable fuels using just the energy from the sun I'm thinking, you know, when your child doesn't clean their room, 
you know, it could probably be a sustainable uh, source of sustainable energy. Okay, the researchers from the University of Cambridge developed a solar-powered reactor that converts captured CO2 and plastic waste into sustainable fuels and other valuable chemical pr products. In tests, CO2 was converted into syngas, which is a key building block for sustainable liquid fuels, and plastic bottles were converted into glycolic acid, which is widely used in the cosmetic industry. Unlike earlier tests of their solar fuels technology, however, the team took CO2 from real-world sources, such as industrial exhaust or the air itself. The researchers were able to capture and concentrate the CO2 and convert it into sustainable fuel. Although improvements are needed before this technology can be used at, as, at an industrial scale, the results, reported in the journal Joule, represent another important step toward the production of clean fuels to power the economy without the need for environmentally destructive oil and gas extraction. Amen. For several years, Professor Erwin Reisner's research group, excuse me, um, <laughs> sorry, my computer, um, I'm so distractible, uh, research group based in the U Yusuf Hamid Department of Chemistry has been developing sustainable net zero carbon fuels inspired by photosynthesis the process by which plants convert sunlight into food using artificial leaves. These artificial leaves convert CO2 and water into fuels using just the power of sun. To date, their solar-driven experiments have used pure concentrated CO2 from a cylinder. But for the technology to be practical, it needs to be able to actively capture CO2 from industrial processes or directly from the air. However, since CO2 is just one of many types of molecules in the air we breathe, making this technology selective enough to convert highly diluted CO2 is a huge technical challenge. We're not just interested in decarbonization, but defossilization. We need to completely eliminate fossil fuels in order to create a truly circular economy, said Reisner. In the medium term, this technology could help reduce carbon emissions by capturing them from industry and turning them into something useful. But ultimately, we need to cut fossil fuels out of the occasion entirely and capture CO2 from the air. Amen. Again. The researchers took their inspiration from carbon capture and storage, also known as CCS, where CO2 is captured and then pumped and stored underground. CCS is a technology that's popular with the fossil fuel industry as a way to reduce carbon emissions while continuing oil and gas exploration, said Reisner. But if instead of carbon capture and storage, we had carbon capture and utilization, we could make something useful from CO2 instead of burying it underground with unknown long-term consequences and eliminate the use of fossil fuels. The researchers adapted their solar-driven technology so that it works with flue gas or directly from the air, converting CO2 and plastics into fuel and chemicals using only the power of the sun. By bubbling air through the system containing an alkaline solution, the CO2 selectively gets trapped, and the other gases present in air, such as nitrogen and oxygen, harmlessly bubble out. This bubbling process allows the researchers to concentrate the CO2 from air and solution, making it easier to work with. The integrated system contains a photocathode and an anode, and it has two compartments. On one side is captured CO2 solution that gets converted to syngas, a simple fuel. On the other side, plastics are converted into useful chemicals using only sunlight. The plastic component is an important trick to the system, said, said co-first author, Dr. Motia Rahman. Capturing and using CO2 from the air makes the chemistry more difficult, but if we add plastic waste to the system, the plastic donates electrons to the CO2. The plastic breaks down to glycolic acid, which, as they said earlier, is widely used in the cosmetics industry, and the CO2 is converted to syngas, which is a simple fuel. This solar-powered system takes two harmful waste products, 
plastic and carbon emissions and converts them into something truly useful, said co-first author Dr. Sayan Kar. Instead of storing CO2 underground, like in CCS, we can capture it from the air and make clean fuel from it, said Rahman. This way, we can cut the fossil fuel industry out of the process of fuel for production, which can hopefully help us avoid climate destruction. The fact that we can effectively take CO2 from air and make something useful from it is special, said Carr. It is satisfying to see that we can actually do it using only sunlight. And can, in conclusion, the scientists are currently working on a benchtop demonstrator device with improved efficiency and practicality to highlight the benefits of coupling direct air capture with CO2 utilization as a path to a zero carbon future. Thank you. Wow, that is really amazing news and I hope it gets really um, picked up by industry and used like in practicality. So thank you for sharing those great news. So, I really that hope. is super interesting because you can even think about an uh, application where like if you could potentially even use the CO2 to like feed like plants, you know what I'm saying? Like that, that's really cool. Yeah, it's it's really it's really astonishing. So I I really hope this gets subsidized a lot and you know put it in use as far as fast as we can, hopefully. Yeah, I mean there's just there's so many reasons to say yes, and we've had plenty of opportunity in this particular room in the past when people come up and say, well, yeah, but that's expensive, <laughs> you know, and then we point toward other. Um, applications of our financial resources and economic resources that are that are also costly and this one this is worth it and we we keep hearing about new technologies that are you know that will bring us closer to the zero carbon future and it just seems like um, you know the math is it has to be on our side you know that that we have that we have um, multiple options to be zero carbon and multiple multiple clean fuel options to draw from um, i was i was reading about for example with with ev charging stations that there's worry whether california is going to be able to provide ample power to you know to supply energy to the charging station so it's it is important to have more than one more than one resource to to be able to rely on for us to really um, you know move from carbon and and I think that because the what we're used to now is we've got you know we've got these petrochemicals that were that were this is in everybody's mind and it's one one energy source that we are so heavily reliant on maybe it's that's part of the solution is is sharing the idea that that our energy will come from multiple resources in the future yeah and i will say although i think all these these projects at the research stage you know, or at least many of them could end up being you know scalable and, and at a large scale we do also have to consider i mean i've heard the viewpoint um, from citizens climate lobby that I belong to that that really though we have to build up the ones that we have right now also because unfortunately the re things in the research stage are going to take a while to get to the stage where they can be scalable you know and and they're not even at the stage you know they're still in the research stage and they're all great I love to see them but we really have to also just do the things that we already have the technology for and just do it now and just get the political will to to do it like solar panels and batteries and so on and you know there's other things that are really close to this that are being you know invested in and that, that are close to to being there and, and are um, but anyway I'll, i'm gonna also put something in the chat because i'm on the email list for for a, a group that is giving awards for different things for use of carbon in the atmosphere and so um they they were 
talking about awards for like eight different projects. And so there are a lot of projects and, and I like to see it, but, but we also just have to go with what we got also. Anyway, thanks, I'm done. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I completely agree. And uh, welcome, Dr. Heidi. Did you want to add something, say something? Oh, thank you for having me, Katrina, on the stage now. Um, I'm appreciating it. I'm just uh, listening because I just joined you. And sorry, I've been late. I'm so sorry. Well, we're glad to see you whenever you get here. Thank you for joining. Thank you so much, Vicky. Katarina, how would you like oh, to Oh, sorry, share I was, <laughs> yeah, I was. No mute. problem. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I have a bunch of robots, uh, news, robotic news that I thought were really interesting. Um, and uh, groundbreaking AI, I know we've been probably tired of hearing about AI, <laughs> but I thought since we had the flute, it kind of fits into the theme that we had today. Um, so I thought this was a really interesting and very useful AI project. Um, and th in this AI project, they could, um, bar with the press of a button, translate instantaneously, um, um, a program from Akkadian cuneiform and it will enable tens of thousands of digitized but unread tablets uh, to be translated into English and the accuracy is still debatable but um, you know the, the speed of this is really un, you know unprecedented so a team of archaeologists and computer scientists from Israel have created an AI-powered translation program for ancient Akkadian cuneiform, allowing tens of thousands of um, already digitized tablets to be translated into English instantaneously. Globally, libraries, museums and universities have more than half of a million clay tablets inscribed with a cuneiform. But the she I'm sorry, is it a lot of background noise or or is it okay? It's okay. Oh, it's fine. Fine for me. Okay. You're the one with the sensitive ears. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now my kids are It sounds really them. nice. Okay. <laughs> and um, they have more than half a million of these clay tablets inscribed and um, the sheer number of texts and the tiny number of Akkadian readers a language no one has spoken or written for 2,000 years means just a small fraction of these tablets has been translated. Now Google Translate Thai program may allow um, armchair archaeologists to try their hand at cuneiform interpretation. What's so amazing about it is that I don't need to understand Akkadian at all to translate and get what's behind the cuneiform said Gay Gutherz, a computer scientist who was part of the team that developed the program. I can just use the algorithm to understand and discover what the past has to say. And um, the project began as a thesis project for Gutherz uh, when he did his master's at Tel Aviv University. And then in May, the team published the research paper, which was peer reviewed by PNAS Nexus from the Oxford University Press. Um, and then it goes more into detail. I thought it was interesting because I don't know if uh, people remember we had the uh, guest speaker here a few months ago that he talked about um, imaging of, um, of old texts, um, like really um, texts that were under um, written text, overwritten text. So you have a lot of time since um, the scripts, they were pre really expensive uh, that people over time reused them and wrote over them. And to read what was underneath and the older text, they had to use very, um, you know, the complicated or high-tech imaging tools. And he presented those 
and then um, he said that now the problem is not the imaging anymore because he developed also a tool that is portable which was really important because the libraries don't like to send them out anywhere those old scripts because if something gets damaged in transport or so it's a very high risk it's irreplaceable um so the scaling of the imaging was working well but then you know the people that are available at the time that is available to read then all of this is kind of the bottleneck and we <laughs> i think we uh exactly propose this that uh, to connect with Google and then we reached out to to a researcher that was collaborating with Google on the nuclear fusion program um, so I, I have to check what what went out of this but this is basically kind of <laughs> the the idea we then had to connect them so it's wonderful to see and I hope it gets expanded to different types of scripts, uh, old scripts, um, languages, and so on. So we can learn more about our past and the knowledge we had in the past. I think that's always exciting. Does anyone want to add something? Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm actually doing some mad Googling because we we were also, you had reminded me of, there was, there was the research team, it's a husband and wife team, and maybe we were just discussing it, and they were, they were picking up um, chemical residue on old documents that, that hadn't, nobody had, um, they were the first people, do you know what I'm talking about? And nobody had developed this method before, and they were able to, see what was there without really destroying the documents and by doing so they determined things like um, you know diseases that people had had and what people might have died of and I'm um, you remember it looks like you've got the thumbs up <laughs> who was that yeah I remember that we read it the article but I don't know the names. I can never yeah. remember names. I, I'm gonna look because it was it was it was talking about it was a, it was a um, there was a European composer I think who had and and their cause of death had been unclear and this this research helped determine what they most likely had died of because of maybe even they were able to to pick up. Um, trace um, molecules from their breath even and and some I'm gonna look I'm gonna look more but thank you this is this is really thought-provoking and so exciting well that re reminds me of um, I think I read at one point that that they think maybe that Beethoven became deaf from some kind of heavy metal poisoning from the kind of crockery that they used or something like that and then maybe they used a hair analysis or something, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to look that yeah. up. Yeah, and then it came out that the people that claimed to be his descendants were not really directly, um, you know, we're not really directly connected. They were like really far off because apparently, you know, he didn't have kids, but the, he had niece and and uh, apparently, you know, the lineage was really not the lineage of Beethoven, the people that claimed to be in the lineage of him. So that was kind of a bad side effect of the study. Yeah, they had a shock. They were no longer of the Beethoven family. <laughs> Must have been a shock for him. And, and that's reminding me of my Egyptian ancestors as well. You know, that half of me Egyptian or quarter of me Egyptian. So um, I do remember and recall uh, a famous Egyptologist, Zahi Hawass, and he has a documentary on Netflix talking about the Queen Hatshepsut death, um, how they discovered that this cancer exists from uh, 5,000 years ago through the CT scans and the MRI they try to do to uh, mummies nowadays. So um, 
research like this, it's really eye-opening for our ancestors and the genes and how genes actually um, uh, been translated and transcribed uh, on different ears. So it's it's a really provocative, as Victoria said. I actually um, echo here in, in, in different nations, especially with those all the cultures of Romanian, Greek, Egyptian. It will uh, start to uh, create a new opportunities to discover the old world in different eyes. Thank you, Katerina. <laughs>
at early age of five, it really makes a huge difference. It's shaping our whole um, life of open-mindedness and gives the confidence and self-esteem that no one can actually um, put you down because of your accent or your race or your skin color and you can actually stay strong and have those lovely discussions of um, the way forward for unity that there are more things that unifying us than making, uh, than making a difference in our life. So it's really a great discussion to adopt in every single house and with everyone. It's giving us a strength, not a weakness, and the highlighting the confidence from early stage. And I encourage everyone from the age of five, this is the age of um, early comprehension, and they can get it. We, uh, we think it's that they cannot get it at this age, but they can get it and they are very smart. Thank you, Katerina. Yeah, I, you know, when I moved as a kid to Germany, I now understand my favorite book is um, The Little I Am Me. In German, it's way nicer because it really rhymes and it's very cute you can write in english it's a wonderful book it's this very weird looking little um plush animal you know with stumpy legs and like it looks really handmade and he walks around the world and wants to know like the, i think the parrots are so go to him and say who are you what are you you don't seem to look like um a dog or a bird or a fish or anything you're nothing like who are you what are you so he come, becomes very upset um, upset and walks around the world and asks everyone to look for similarities he kind of finds everywhere some similarities but then thinks that he is different and then the end is you know i am me and then he says it very confidently uh, and goes back to everyone, I am me, don't you know? It's so logic, I am just me, and everyone cheers. So, And then you have in the end um, uh, instructions how to make the I am me a plushy yourself. So uh, I used to love that book, and it rhymes really beautifully in German. It doesn't rhyme as well in English, but it still works. It's a, it's a pretty book. And first it's gray, all black and white, and then it's in colors. So yeah, it's, it's really beautiful if you like to read something like that to your kids. I'm going to look that up. What a great, great book, because it's one of the one of the ways that people um, that when when you are different from others and and kids might ask you, you know, why do you look that way or why do you eat that or why don't you celebrate this holiday? then all those ways that, that you are different, even if that's the only question people are ask, asking you, those can tear away at your, your sense of identity and your self-esteem. But coming at, even, even though, you know, we may have heard as kids or we tell our kids, you know, these are things that are special about you and everybody has something special about them or their family. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Um, we can't hear that enough, really, at any age. Anything that's unique to us is something that makes us wonderful. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to look at this, this book. And, and even, um, you know, Dr. Heidi, you were, you were saying that it's, it's just kids are never too young to talk about this. Kids are, you know, kids are experiencing uh, racism at every age. and kids can learn about racism and, and what it is. And, and I also have seen that kids ask for what they are ready to hear the answer to. You know, when we follow the lead of, of the questions of young people, it seems that they're asking the questions that, that they're ready to comprehend in their own way. So um, thank you. Thank you for sharing this book. And it, it is important that we are always talking about our similarities and at the same time celebrating our differences as equally important. I'm so sorry, I, 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 you provoked me again, Victoria. I have to tell you this story and it's real story. My son, when he was um, five years old in his um, primary school, when he just started primary school, 
um, we very multicultural within our family. So I have a German ancestors and uh, Egyptian and Turkish, so I am fade skin. However, my husband, he is dark skin and my son is olive skin. So he is the only one, he was the only one in the school with the olive skin. And I do remember this discussion with his friends on first day asking him, why you are different, why your skin are different. And it was in the time, he is 17 now, it was in the time when he, um, I used to uh, actually watch the news with him and reflect on the news and take those hard discussions with him when he was in four and a half years, five years. And um, Obama in this time won the elections. And he said to them all, who cares? Obama wins. We still have a voice, even if we have a different color, but we have beautiful brains. To be honest, I learned it from my son to be confident and to speak like him. And he taught me a big lesson that I stand up for what I believe in and don't affect by anyone. And I said, oh my God, I, I, he, he taught me a lesson when he was just starting school and he get an award from the principal of the school because he's he stand up for everyone he is the only dark skin he's the only olive skin in the school but he take it with a conf confidence and resilience unbelievable so um, please share those great ideas and discussions and indirect discussions with your kids you never know when it will come up and when they will stand for themselves and when we when they will be actually um, uh, saying uh, those statements, which is really uh, uh, surprising me and the, everyone in the family. So thank you. I thought it's, it's worth sharing with you um, those moments of confidence and self-esteem. Thank you. I have to respond <laughs> um, that what you're saying speaks to the importance of giving our youth the language to address these issues because that's really fantastic that your son had that language in his vocabulary and that those concepts to respond with that that meant everything so he could be there to demonstrate for the kids you know for you for kids who were speaking to him i can remember um, in my experience kids asking me why do your eyes look like that are you mexican and being completely, that was the first time I ever had an idea that maybe there, it was being othered, you know, it was, it, it was, it was, um, it was something I'd never experienced before. But I didn't know, I didn't know how to address it or what to say. Um, and it's, and it's also really an honest thing to, to notice, to point out differences, um, and, and maybe the ways, if the way that we can do it is, I don't want to use the word diplomatic, you know, in, in a caring and respectful way so that, again, we're celebrating each other's differences instead of othering each people, each other through recognizing them. Um, it was definitely a situation that, you know, I was, I just didn't know how to respond. I didn't even, it didn't feel great, but I didn't know how to share that or really even what had happened that didn't feel great. So hearing that your son <laughs> was, was ready to go <laughs> and with that is, again, how fantastic it is to, to have all of these conversations and to talk about these things even before, even before, um, you know, just like this book that you're sharing, Katarina, just sharing things like that so that we are, kids are ready to go when they're noticing things or, or have these experiences. Yeah, and differences can be about anything also. Don't think that, you know, just, you know, it can be about anything. It can be because, I don't know, your parents have a different job than most of others have. It can be, you know, kids can, and also the teachers or like the social environment can make differences because of, anything and uh, yeah just having kids prepared to to be inclusive and that's what I kind of like about this book is that uh, you know it's about differences in general 
um, you know, it can be because of, you know, how somebody speaks different, maybe has, you know, autism or, you know, it, it can be anything. And um, yeah, so it's, um, yeah, it's important in general. Um, because we are personally comfortable and seeing differences and and being inclusive in one aspect of life or uh, different humans doesn't mean we also ourselves are as inclusive in other aspects and it's kind of good to to also keep that in mind that we all have biases and we can keep each other in check kind of and it's it's normal to make mistakes especially for kids you know, or, you know, react in a certain way as long as we kind of address it appropriately. And, and then, um, yeah, are all inclusive, you know, like mental health. Okay, it can be anything <laughs> that, that kids get uh, excluded for or treated differently. So, yeah. Okay, so shall we go to um, a robot stopping bleeding? Um, I thought that was really interesting. We, I think we heard a lot of news, um, you know, with tiny robots uh, that will in the future hopefully perform a lot of things uh, for us, like killing cancer hopefully and so on. And uh, this um, could maybe uh, stop bleeding in the future from the inside of the body using heat. A centimeter sized robot with a soft body and metallic scales inspired by pangolins can stop bleeding or destroy cells from the inside the, from inside the body using heat. Um, it can shape shift and produce heat. Could incinerate cancer cells or stop bleeding from inside the body it could also be used to ferry drugs directly to tumors or hard to reach places like arteries these tiny robots with soft bodies have shown promise for delivering drugs without causing damage but adding hard elements could make them more useful Ren Hao Soon uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in Stuttgart Germany and his colleagues designed the centimeter-sized robot to have overlapping aluminium plates inspired by pangolins, the only mammal with scales. They layered a rectangular scales over softer magnetic materials which let the robot change its shape. To make sure it moves, curls up, stretches out or gets uh, to getting warm, the researchers directed magnetic fields at the robot's metal parts. Changing the frequency of these fields could also make the scales heat up, allowing the robot to blast its surroundings with heat. They found that the robot's body could warm up more than 70 Celsius. The researchers also used the robot's heat to deliver cargo within a model of a stomach. They stuck a piece of rubbery material to the robot to imitate capsules of medicine. The adhe adhesive they used dissolve when the robot warmed up, deposing the cargo. This could allow for targeted drug del delivery within the body. Soon um, and his colleagues also tested the robot's ability to stop bleeding from wounds using the stomach of a dead pig. They stimulated bleeding by pumping blood with a syringe to a small cut. Then the robot stretched out and laid over the spot, heating it up to make the blood clot. Jake Abbott at the University of Utah says the robot could also be used to kill tumor cells in a targeted way instead of exposing large amounts of tissue to radiation or chemicals. You could raise the temperature of the robot above an unsafe levels for normal cells and hold it in place for a few minutes, which would then kill the tumor cells. Yeah, I think, you know, this is really great news. It's maybe still a little bit big for uh, certain places uh, it won't fit through you know it will fit through bigger uh, blood vessels and so on not necessarily in smaller ones let's say you have like bleeding in the liver or something I think that would be really harder but yeah in stomach or something like that that would be great but I guess 
it wouldn't be a big issue to kind of scale down the size um, and target the magnets there. So yeah, I think it's great. I encourage people to watch the video that's in this. It's incredible. It's, it's really, um, it's just sweet to see this little robot rolling around doing its job. Thank you, Katarina. This is amazing. Well, I add my voice to Katarina that it's uh, it can be used with a stomach, but um, uh, it doesn't. It, it can be used actually with liver, and I am thinking of those. Uh, it's it's sometimes the bleeding. It's a diagnostic. Uh, thing for doctors to figure out pain and uh, bleeding one of the signs to detect diseases and it's an early signs for diseases so i think there will be lots of research especially with um, the mechanism itself the clots developing clots again it's really um, it, it needs a hematologist to figure out the consistency of the blood and it's not over um, like uh, the heparin, which is uh, uh, an anticoagulant uh, factor in the blood it, to be on the right level and not developing a clots, which is go to the bloodstream and go to the heart and causing issues. So I think um, from um, a biomedical engineer's side, it's really a great in invention. But from the doctor's side, I think it needs a lot of um, multidisciplinary integration sort of uh, research to um, uh, research the bits and pieces, especially w with the liver thing and um, esophagus and the cancer of esophagus and the liver. It's really one of the early signs doctors use. Um, the bleeding and the bleeding amount and the blood color, it's one of the um, indicators they look at. So um, I, 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 as Katerina says, it's, it's an early stage, but it's a great actually uh, novel science in terms of the concept itself. Thank you. Well, maybe also as um, in response to that concern, it could be used as part of diagnostics to to observe the, those characteristics that you were mentioning, this, the quality of the blood and the location of bleeding, if it had um, camera or other, um, other attachments that helped it, helped it to test for those, those specific questions that you were bringing up. And again, reminding me of the nature and nature reviews and technical reviewers in nature actually ask those critical questions, which is a whole kind of research by itself. Always when I send for them a manuscript, me and my friends, they have those lovely um, questions which which actually lead us to another research and the great research which is uh, this is how research and science actually develop so um, thank you and i feel always in this room that we are in a workshop or we are in actually a brainstorming scientific uh, arena in the universities so thank you again for providing this greatest base of knowledge thank you yeah, thank you, Dr. Heidi. It's always wonderful having you here and you spark really interesting conversations um, with your contribution. And hi, Adam, did you want to add something to this or comment? Uh, okay, um, if you don't have anything to add right now, we can, it's another robotic um, device that I thought was interesting from the terms of how this robot can manipulate um, objects by touch alone. So there is no vision or optic based tactile finger. So the team from Columbia University um, has improved the dexterity of robot fingers so they can now manipulate complex objects without dropping them. You know, 
um, developing uh, hands that really function like our hands is really hard for engineering. And um, yeah, lately, you know, with artificial skins and so on, they have been making great progress. So um, in terms of human features that robots are probably the most jealous of, um, our fingers um, that have to be, you know, that that are cl close to what we have because our fleshy little digits have crazy amount of dexterity relative to their size and so many sensors packed into them that allow you to manipulate complex objects um, without, you know, without seeing basically touch base. Obviously, these are capabilities that would be really nice to have in a robot, especially if you want them. Um, I'm sorry, Adam, I'm going to mute you because I'm reading the article. Um, there are two parts to this problem. The first is having the fingers that can perform like human fingers. Um, the second is having the intelligence necessary to do something useful with those fingers. So once... Um, so in this paper, just accepted to robotic science and systems, um, researchers from Columbia University have shown how to train robotic fingers to perform dexterous in-hand manipulation of complex objects without dropping them. What's, the, what's more, the manipulation is done entirely by touch, no vision required. Those um, slightly chunky fingers have a lot going on inside of them. Um, underneath the skin of each finger is a flexible reflective membrane and under that membrane is an array of LEDs along with an array of photodiodes. Each LED is cycled on and off for a fraction of millisecond and the photodiodes record how the light from each LED reflects off the inner membrane of the finger. The pattern of that reflection changes when the membrane flexes, which is what happens if the finger is contacting with something. A trained model can correlate that light pattern with the location and amplitude of finger contacts. So now that you have fingers that know that they are touching something, they also need to know how to touch something in order to manipulate it the way you want them without uh, them dropping anything. There are so many objects that are robot friendly when it comes to manipulation and some that are robot hostile, like objects with complex shapes and concavities, L or U shapes. And uh, with a limited number of fingers, doing in-hand manipulation is often at odds with making sure that the object remains in a stable grip. This is a skill called finger gating, and it takes practice. Or in this case, it takes reinforcement learning. The trick that the researchers use is to combine sampling-based methods with reinforced learning to develop a control policy trained on the entire state space. While this method works well, the whole non-vision thing is something of an artificial constraint. This isn't to say that the ability to manipulate objects in darkness or clutter isn't super important. It's just that there's even more potential with vision. Once we um, also add visual feedback into the mix along with touch we hope to be able to achieve even more dexterity and when they start approaching the replication of a human hand um, yeah so in the end there's the link uh, to the actual paper and um, yeah I thought this was really interesting also to have this in the dark I think you know um, you probably want to send robots um, to like very um, conditions that are really not safe for humans. Let's say, you know, after an earthquake or so, um, you could send robots to find people and maybe even help them. And you want to, you know, hands are really helpful to like grab something out of the way or bring something or, you know, bring some water, a bottle of water or food or um, you know grab something help people out and it's probably pretty dark in those different places that are kind of hostile for people um, so I would imagine for example a hand like that that uh, can do it without you know uh, completely without vision would probably be really helpful 
in this different um, situations where robots would be really yeah crucial for for helping saving lives i don't know i couldn't think about many more but since this earthquake event this horrific earthquake was this year that's the first thing that came up to my mind where these heads would maybe be helpful i was actually just thinking that would be super cool to use in like space like you could like literally just grab a rock you know what i'm saying like or at least even if it's like like actually like if it's not like on another planet like mars or venus or something you can just grab like a space rock or like i don't know if you uh remember those like a uh like a, a satellite that had like kind of purposely like crashed into like an asteroid to get like a sample from it but like why would you now need to do that we can just kind of like slow yourself down and stick out a hand and just grab a handful you know what i'm saying or, or and if you can like use this technology to make like uh a hand you could definitely do it to just make like like uh some type of like like grabbing device to maybe like a, even like a claw or something like that's super cool yeah i agree that would be really cool and I think the the important thing would be I don't know how well it can it can uh, you know they said the not dropping thing but also I would add the not crushing thing I don't know how well it's trained for it like different fragility and how heavy something is how hard you need to grab it versus you will break it um, probably there's still some training left to do, but uh, I think that's just another step that's probably, you know, manageable to achieve. Um, so um, I guess that that would be really important or how hard to, I don't know, like screw things in or um, hammer, I don't know, whatever would be needed to fix things also in space. Um you know, you, you, I think you waste, we spend a lot of time on training astronauts to just fix things uh, on space stations and so on, um, uh, outside of um, their shuttle and whatever. I think, don't you think it would be more useful to have these type of robots doing this and they can do whatever experiments they need to do inside? I mean, Probably they also enjoy sometimes going out there, but you know, it, once you have this robots, I guess you don't need to spend a lot of time of training all these different assembly steps um, for for this specific situations anymore. One hundred percent. You could even kind of like that's actually a whole another idea. Like um, for people who like work in construction or, or or like mechanics or engineering, like if you could like get a control on the the power of the the grab, you can even make like a, a new form of like a vice grip to like loosen and tighten things. You know what I'm saying? But like instead of like using a tool, it could be like damn like a glove. You know what I'm saying? Like like this is actually really pretty cool. I'm imagining all these robots crawling all over the bridges in the city all day long. <laughs> People, they look probably like spiders with human hands. No, that just sounds <laughs> terrifying. <up> <laughs> like, uh, what was that movie, uh, Terminator? <laughs> or like, like the Matrix, how like they have like those like little like kind of insect looking like drones. Like, this is where it all starts, the robot hand. <laughs> well, it would be really useful because, you know, the bridge that collapsed in Philly. I mean, and they are fixing it quite quickly. But, you know, to have these robots constantly scan and, and at the same time, if they can, you know, report back, but also fix something, that would be really useful. You know, a bolt that is, I don't know, crumbling apart or... You know some some concrete at that spot that needs you know fixing i think it would be really safe for tunnels where stuff is leaking i'm just thinking of the old jersey tunnel 
um, you know, I, I think it would be really helpful to to have things like this scan, you know, very important, you know, arteries of what did that guy say arteries of our infrastructure to have them checked like this. Yeah, you, you just kind of brought up another idea, like with infrastructure, like um, I was in a, a room earlier today and they were talking about uh, the submarine incident. And it's like, well, instead of sending man things down there, if you have something that can actually grab things like, you, can, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's a, another way to to like search uncharted places kind of like how you were saying like with the uh, volcanic eruptions and stuff yeah we will have crawling robots in our veins all day long and everywhere <laughs> 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 hi john hi alder um did you want to <laughs> add something well i just wanted to say i saw a video recently and it's nothing I don't think it's new, it's just having the system in place. Um, over in Dubai, they have cars that drive around and just like LIDAR systems that can basically scan the road for infrastructure issues. It is not anything you couldn't have done for the last 10 years. I'm just thinking it's just something that it's maybe they're putting that in place. It's just LIDAR or cameras, things of that nature. It's a scan, you know roads and everything to like track like you know cracks or issues with roads and bridges it exists it's just a matter yeah of but can they fix things with their hands well they can <laughs> fix it it's just a matter of do you have the money and infrastructure and the people to do it yeah yeah but we are but talking about the robots you know with their hands that can then go there and fix it for well, you. they can. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. just right now it'd be manual labor, probably, but like you could do a robot, maybe. But the, why create a robot to do that when you're going to labor for, like pennies on the dollar? Why would you? Well, with these hands, you could send people into places that are really dangerous or maybe dark, as you said, like tunnels out in space, wherever. And one day these will become really cheap. Um, and you can, you know, not just scan constantly something, but have this robot also perform the repair right there on the spot. Um, True. Know. Right. And even after that, you can imagine like all of the, the super kind of pretty damn dangerous jobs out there. Like why continue to take on the risk of human death when you can just have a robot do it and not have to worry about people dying? Exactly. Yeah, also with climate change, right, we had uh, for Qatar, uh, for the construction of the World Cup, uh, people dying of heat um, issues, um, I think over a thousand people or so died uh, during construction because of heat. So, you know, with Jesus. climate change, you'll have more and more of this, especially for Ooh. construction workers, like, are exposed to uh, extreme would, weather and you could just would, avoid that yeah i would make the argument you'd have to make laws draconian enough to make that make sense so if if i could hire someone and they die and i could pay fifty thousand dollars to make that go away for someone that is rich enough it wouldn't matter if they pay fifty thousand dollars if i had paid a hundred thousand dollars for an equivalent robot. So that has to be something that has to be taken into account. If that makes sense. Like I, if I can hire Yeah, but the own, cost will go down. We already have. No, you're right. Yeah, but currently, but... if you want something that's very, you know, like hardcore, like engineering grade or, you know, uh, in like those kinds of grades of robots, and you got to pay a million dollars for that robot and I can just pay someone from I'm just making this up. I don't think it's the wrong way. But I could go to like Somalia or Sudan and say I'll pay someone from there, you know, like two dollars an hour to do the work and when they die, I just pay their family fifteen thousand dollars. 
why would I pay a hundred thousand dollars for? Seriously. Yeah, yeah no... I'm not in a. I, we are not really in a politics room here. We are discussing what would no, be but that's what possible, you have to and then the future. I I design fucking computers, and I'm just saying that that's what you have to deal with. So let me. I don't know if this is your first time to the room, Bido, uh, but so this is a room where we talk about uh, emerging scientific topics, right? Mm, uh, yeah. And what Katharina was just trying to let you know, uh, which I actually did a pretty good job at. So I don't even have to. I shouldn't. I don't even have to re- repeat it. But um, we don't worry about the future and what that could hold because we worry about. Uh, we care about the science, right? Like whether or not uh the emergence of, of robots that can do normal human jobs uh doesn't mean as much to the science that we have new technology being developed uh than a political potential political aspects of it you know what i'm saying so like uh if you do have something to add to the actual topic that'd be great but we don't want to dive off the the deep end of politics bro no, it's not about the deep in politics. It's just reality. I understand what you're saying. I'm just trying to get into the reality of things. You're probably, I get what you're saying. So yeah, if we just want to just focus on the technology itself, yes, you're 100% right. If you get into the reality of what it is, that's because that's what I do. I, I, I'm in technology development. That's exactly what I do. And, and that's one of the things that comes into play in some of these things. It's just like, you can come up with the coolest thing ever. And then, yeah, all that crap you just mentioned that we don't talk about, you're not talking about, I agree with you. If it doesn't rear its head, it would be fantastic. But if it does, it causes, to, it causes all kinds of non, uh, non-intended non issues that you don't want to deal with. Yeah, if we want to just yeah, agree. If we want to do into that, let, let's just do that. That'd be that'd be great. It would set those as boundaries for this this discussion. Sounds good. So, what you guys got for the next uh, paper? Yeah, this one is really cool, uh, and I'm really looking forward for this to become like available for people. I don't know how fast that will be, but it's really cool. Liquid metal breakthrough can transform everyday materials into electronic smart devices so uh chinese scientists oh no i have this thing where the article is gone there have devised a technique to code everyday materials like paper and um somebody can can you please mute while i'm reading excuse me let's be on mute yeah so, um, I'm sorry, this is not there. Yeah, I have to turn on my laptop. I'm really sorry. On the phone, the, the advertisement keeps popping up and uh, I can't really read the article anymore. Um, there. Okay. Um, they have created... Um, this material uh, which involves adjusting pressure rather than using binding material successfully enables the liquid metal to adhere to surfaces a previously challenging task due to high surface tension Um, everyday materials such as a paper plastic could be transformed into electronic smart devices by using a simple new method to apply liquid metal to surfaces and this study was published in the Journal of Cell Reports, Physical Science, and demonstrates a technique for applying liquid metal coating to surfaces that do not easily bond with liquid metal. The approach is designed to work at a large scale and may have applications in wearable, testing platforms, flexible devices, and soft robotics. Before, we thought that it was impossible for liquid metal to adhere to non-wetting surfaces so easily, but here it can adhere to various surfaces only by adjusting the pressure, which is very interesting. Scientists seek to combine liquid metal with traditional materials have been impeded by liquid metal's extremely high surface tension, which prevents it from binding with most materials, including paper. To overcome this issue, they have previously focused on the technique called transfer printing, which involved 
is using a third material to bind the liquid metal to the surface. But this strategy comes with drawbacks. Adding more materials can complicate the process and may weaken the end product's electrical, thermal or mechanical performance. And to explore an alternative um, they, um, that would allow them to directly print liquid metal on substrates without sacrificing the metal's properties, Yuan and colleagues applied two different liquid metals, e gaun and Bilm um, S N. Um, to various silicon and silicon <laughs> polymer stamps, then applied different forces as they rubbed the stamp onto paper surfaces. At first, it was hard to realize stable adhesion of the liquid metal coating in the substrate, said Yuan. However, after a lot of trial and error, we finally had the right parameters to achieve stable, repeatable adhesion. The researchers found that rubbing the liquid metal covered stamp against the paper with a small amount of force enabled the metal droplets to bind effectively to the surface while applying large amount of force prevented the droplets from staying in place. Next, the team folded the metal. Can you please now just stay uh, muted while I'm reading? Thank you. Next, the team folded the metal coated paper into a crane, a paper crane demonstrating that the surface can still be folded as usual after the process is completed. And after doing so, the modified paper still maintains its usual properties. While the uh, technique appears promising, you are noted that the researchers are still figuring out how to guarantee that the liquid metal coating stays in place after it has been applied. For now, a packaging material can be added to the paper surface but the team hopes to figure out the solution that won't require it. Just like wet ink on paper can be wiped off by hand, the liquid metal coating without packaging here can also be wiped off by the object it touches as it is applied. The properties of the coating itself will not be greatly affected, but objects in contact may be soiled. In the future, the team also plans to build a method on the method so it can be used to apply liquid metal to a greater variety of surfaces, including metal and ceramic. ceramic. We also plan to construct smart devices using materials treated by this method. And yeah, underneath there's the reference uh, for the paper. And uh, yeah, I think this is really cool, uh, especially if it's, you know, a relatively cheap, cheap process. And scalable, uh, you can you can imagine all kinds of applications for this technique. Oh, it's it's amazing. When I mean, is this pen, C-I-N. You know what sounds super cool? Like if you if like because I'm not saying think about liquid metal. I'm just thinking like any like periodic table metal. Uh, but imagine if they could like kind of formulate this into like a uh like a solar panel that could be like put on like anything so you can coat buildings with it coat cars coat clothes you know what i'm saying like that would be wild yeah if it can like measure you know your body temperature um... uh heart rate you know how much you're sweating you know, oxygen, um, blood oxygen, I mean, all kinds of things um, that could be really helpful in health. And the cheaper it would get, the more it would actually be, up, actually be applied. But also, um, I could imagine, you know, very cheap, if it would be cheap to to have better sensors and more broadly for agriculture to be you know, um, less polluting, like uh, just use the amount of uh, food, uh, like nitrate and stuff that you actually need, like that the plants actually currently need or, um, you know, measure the health of soil, measure maybe, you know, broadly how forest is doing, like how, you know, all kinds of things so you could prevent fires maybe. You know, like everything that we would need to scale up sensors, um, I think, you know, turning anything into a smart device would just scale this up 
and would make our predictions also better for you know what would be good to prevent things in the future it'd probably even be pretty cool for like like space stuff too like if you could like coat like uh like the outsides of like rovers and stuff you can like like maybe put in like little sensors micro like little small sensors for like radiation levels so like you can kind of tell like as it's moving around if it's getting closer or farther from radioactive material so you can kind of map out stuff that's pretty cool man how do you guys find these papers <laughs> like there's so many papers how do y'all do this I don't know. I I don't know. It's probably my weird Google history that just Google just keeps throwing things like, you know, at me. <laughs> it's, you know, you have to have a nerd Google history. That was the funniest thing. So a friend of mine, her husband, you know, she's also a scientist and her husband, and he's very, you know, he's more in like data genomic data mining and science and stuff and uh he's always very you know concerned about data privacy and stuff like that so he made her delete all you know uh, history on all kinds of you know facebook instagram google everywhere and then she was so annoyed after that she said you know i would constantly get this really interesting suggestions what to read and and also advertisement about stuff you know would be cool to use in the lab like from biotech companies and you know stuff new ways of analyzing stuff and chemicals cheaper you know and now i get all this stuff like how to be fertile in your 40s and how to lose weight and anti-wrinkle stuff which i don't give a shit about i'm so annoyed that i deleted my history so you know, there can be a downside to deleting your history. I'm sorry, I couldn't understand. Maybe it's me breaking up, but oh, I, it's I, my I, voice. I'm sick. I couldn't understand it. It was uh, try lithography. Maybe you can lay down like, layers. It's almost like 3D printing. You can, like, you can create sensors using masks and metal, metalized layers. It's how they make semiconductors. Did you hear me out? Okay. I'm sorry, my voice is cut off. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to the next one because I wanted to share two more. Well, we I have a bunch more. I have a bunch of drones ones. And um, so that would make it three. I have one about, you know, restoring, eco a, you know, ecological uh, regions. Um, so I don't know if you want to do two or three, everyone. So I thought this one was interesting because months ago i think end of last year there came you know this um, article out or paper out that a research team has come up with machine learning implemented into robots that copy basically learn based on behavior uh, of other robots of humans whatever and why I thought this was really interesting is because if this would be broadly applied, it would kind of a little bit democratize to teach robot things and have, you know, develop robots that do specific things uh, for everyone because not everyone knows, you know, how to program robots. Um, you would need extensive amount of time that many people maybe that have an idea for a small company or whatever wouldn't have or you live somewhere where you don't have access to cheap education like the US and uh, and if you develop a way that robots can learn by watching similar to like social learning in humans and other animals that would be pretty 
cool so now this got picked up apparently and here it's up in interesting engineering that it actually worked robots had developed the skill to learn by watching videos study reveals and um you know if you would like to have your robot do chores for you or i don't know you have a kitchen or you know um you know a restaurant or any kind of physical labor place and you have a hard time finding somebody that wants to do this job um you know a lot of jobs come to my mind for example in germany it's a huge uh it's a huge problem. You don't have enough people to do manual labor anymore. Like there are millions of jobs uh, where not filled. And actually the economy is kind of uh, going um, into a recession. And a lot has to do with that, you know, companies just don't find people to do manual work or um, all kinds of labor. So, um, yeah, so... Here, this robot, they can, you know, mimic what y you want them uh, to do and household tasks by showing them videos of people doing ordinary activities in their home, like picking up the phone, opening a drawer. So far, scientists have been training robots by physically showing them how a task is done or training them for weeks in simulated environment. Both these methods are taking a lot of time and resources and often even fail, but the CM New team claims that their proposed model, Visual Robotics Bridge, and, um, and how it can make a robot learn a task in just 25 minutes, and that too without involving any humans or simulated environment. This work could drastically improve the way robots are trained and could enable robots to learn from the vast amount of internet and YouTube videos available. Uh, one of the study authors, PhD student at CMU School of Computer Science, says, "Robots have learned how to watch. Have learned to watch and learn. VRB is an advanced version of Wheel in the Wild, human imitating robot learning, a model that researchers has privily, previously used to train robots." And the difference between real and VRB is that the former requires a human to perform a task in front of a robot in a particular environment. After watching the human, the robot could then perform it, but just in the exact same environment. However, in VRB, no human is required. And with some practice, a trainee robot can mimic human operations, even in a setting different from that shown in the video. So it's kind of... A tendency to generalize AI. Don't don't you guys agree? Like, it it goes in that direction. So, yeah. I mean, you don't need to read the full thing because it's kind of late, but you get kind of the idea, and I think it's interesting. And will we need um, not just a rating of videos? How old somebody should be to watch this? But also if it's appropriate for a robot to watch or not, do we need another control, control instance? Like let's say, you know, there's a YouTube video of someone going crazy and shooting everyone. Should we have a parental control for robots basically so that they won't watch that? I was just thinking that like what if like the robot watched like Kung Fu videos and now you get like Kung Fu robot out here just beating people up like how, how do you how do you stop that yeah exactly hi abyss uh yeah it worked there you are i read it's your alma mater interesting please go ahead yeah thanks cat uh, hi everyone um, yeah, I, I think what surprised me most about these kind of things is that how these robots are able to maintain gait. Um, I think that that's probably like a huge feat of engineering um, because trying to mimic activities, routine activities, um, it takes a lot of like, uh, you know, muscular coordination for us to do chores on multi-level. So I'm really, really surprised that these robots can actually maintain um like I said, their stature for the most part, and then be able to do those uh, activity activities, which appear to be kind of routine and mundane to us.
Yeah, I really think it's very interesting that it can perform in then different environments. It really points towards a more generalized form of learning that it kind of abs can abstract into different situations. I think that's that's a really important process that they developed. So, um Yeah, I don't know. Do they also use different hardware? It's not really in the article. Uh, but I'm really surprised like uh, about that step basically that it can, you know, perform these tasks in different environments. Um so yeah, would be interesting to take a deeper dive maybe into the study and invite them if they are willing to come <laughs> to speak. I'll be also interested to see if there is a sort of a long-term, short-term planning involved because as we're kind of moving our arms to kind of reach out to something, um, you know, grab hold and stuff like that, like I said, there is a lot of synchrony involved and there is also a perception that we um, kind of leverage to determine how far the object is from us. So these, you know, robots for the most part, they rely on computer vision to or maybe LIDAR system that can measure the depth or like, you know, kind of map out their 3D environment around their surroundings. But it is, it will be interesting to see if there is sort of like a planning involved that can actually reach out to an object at the shortest distance. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I'll make a note that uh, that I'll write the authors and um, yeah, I think it will be really great. Or we can make a room, you know, if they don't have time and just discuss this paper. But I would need to read it better to discuss it further. But thank you, Abyss. Yeah. Okay, so we have a drone one and then an ecosystem one. So drone, I'm gonna share it also in the chat. If you wanna, you know, throughout the week, see these papers, I, most of them, I think almost all of them I share throughout the, you know, since last week on Twitter, like every day I'll Not every day, but, you know, every other day or so I'll share a bunch of these articles and then I basically take the Twitter account <laughs> and make a list and, you know, we have these rooms and then Victoria um, brings also amazing articles. So thank you again for that. Yeah, so I thought this drone um, was a really cool, um, you know, um, addition to what has been done before and this was um, sh um, the, um, revealed in the Paris Air Show um, which is a bi biennial f trade fair and um, at the show for the first time this year is Atlas the drone startup funded by Ivan Tolchinsky which is providing large number of small drones to Ukrainian forces and unlike the consumer quadcopters widely used for scouting, artillery, direction, bombing, these have military grade communications and which uh, cannot be so easily jammed. Russian jamming brings down thousands of consumer drones each month and while Atlas are touting their jam resistant drones, they also have a new innovation to show off at Paris a tether system giving unlimited flight time. This approach has been tried before and gained little traction. This time though there is a genuine killer application. Known as Atlas Tether, this connects the drone directly to a ground controller which provides the 220 VAC power to 400 VDC conversion required for the drone and allows it to hover indefinitely. The device can take power from a power socket generator or vehicle charger The tether, tether um, I'm sorry, the article jumped again. 
If the tether power and communications are lost, the drone can land automatically on battery power. Oh, uh, yeah, and the tether also supplies a two-way communication with the drone, so there's no need for a radio link, as well as making the drone immune to radio jamming. This means there's no radio emission by either the drone or the ground controller, so they cannot be detected by electronic warfare systems and located for targeting. Atlas have produced this the system in partnership with French company Alistair, which itself um, the tethered drone company and who have already demonstrated 50 hour continuous flights with their Orion 2 small electric drones. Atlas Tether applies the same technology to the Atlas Pro drone with its battlefield sensors. Tethered drones have been around for more than half a century but have enjoyed little success. The West German, why do they keep West? I mean, we are I mean, since the 90s. Anyway, the German military actually operated the Terra Dornia Kibitz observation drone uh, in the 70s. This was intended to carry airborne radar, radio detection, and other equipment to an operating altitude of 985 feet. However, the drone did not cope well with strong winds and was considered to be lim of limited utility. The program was then cancelled in the 80s. <coughs> Tethered drones have remained a small segment of the market as they do not provide the freedom of operation which most drones operators require. The main exception has been Aerostats, tethered lighter than aircraft, extensively operated by the US Army to give a permanent eye in the sky above operating bases. One version known as the uh, 74K Aerostat was developed extensively in Iraq and Afghanistan. In this case, the tether only needs to provide power for the onboard sensors plus high bandwidth communication as the lift is supplied by buoyancy. However, the conflict in Ukraine may have evolved a new use case for which tether drones are ideally suited. Drone guided firing has been transformational, dramatically increasing the precision of Ukraine's artillery. But it takes a lot of work to keep it going. Video of Ukrainian drones crews supporting artillery fire shows that their work includes of a steady stream of picking up returning drones, changing the batteries and sending them out again. Each drone only stays in the air for about 20 minutes before it needs to return for a battery change. Ukrainian crews often complain that they do not have the equivalent of Russian Orlan 10, which, though flawed in some ways, can circle the battlefield for 12 hours or more directing artillery fi fire. But large fixed wings drones like Orlan 10 are expensive at somewhere over 100k a plane. Tethering an electronic drone is a cheap way of giving an artillery spotter a way to locate targets and directly artillery fire for hours on end. In addition, the tether provides greater bandwidth than is available over radio control channels. The tethering system gives the operator a detailed view in real time, compensating for the limitation of a fixed viewpoint. Tethered drones are likely to be added to the list of different types used in Ukraine, and the Paris Air Show is also likely to yield a host of other innovations inspired by a conflict which has been um, a development hothouse for new drone technology. Anything. Anyways, I thought that article was really interesting. Yeah, and they also uh, showed their like a handheld device to uh, bring drones down uh, to to jam them and bring them down, um, which was also kind of interesting. And it's kind of, they developed it in a way that you need basically no training uh, to bring like this, this Russian drones down. So, and it's pretty cheap. It's a plastic thing, like a plastic shooter. So um, yeah, that, that was also an interesting development there. Um, which um, basically increases the the amount of people that could help with jamming uh, Russian drones. Okay, and now 
I need to find the nature paper, which I'm not finding. That's and actually pretty cool and pretty scary when it comes to a military in general. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought, you know, if it's cheap, those handheld devices, if it's cheap, why not, um, you know, automize them and have basically a dome of the systems, you know, that you could could have basically an automized dome over, let's say, a nuclear facility, like very sensitive places where you don't want any attacks for any safety reason. So that you don't have a human physically holding those, but, it, you know, you could put a hundred of those around nuclear power plant and, and create kind of a protective dome. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. I was just yeah, thinking but... like, uh, was like when, uh, sometimes like when, uh, uh, a, a unit's like deployed to like a, a hostile environment, like you'll, you may have the, uh, luxury of a drone, uh, giving you kind of like oversight, or like kind of telling you like what's around and like, if somebody could like, like interfere with that, that would be like horrible <laughs> you know what I'm saying like that's the first thing that came to my mind it might be a matter of power how much power is required to extend the field of influence and how long they can maintain it hey RF is not something that's as simple it's just it may not be a one-to-one -one. you have to I don't want to get into the details but it's just something to consider Yeah, also the handheld devices that are cheap and so you could, you know, there are a lot of annoying people that have drones over like backyards of people and stuff. I mean, if they are cheap, you can just use them and, and shoot them all down if they annoy you enough. So that's another thing. Yeah, I've seen birds of prey trained so ex exclusively try to hunt down um, such drones. I think like those are commercial drones. Okay, and then on maybe a positive note for the future, I hope at least. Um, was this um this article we kind of discussed uh, we had also speakers here that talked about you know the microbiome of different soils what happens after like a mega fire after drought and so on you know uh, scientists analyzing that and hopefully finding ways to rescue um you know soil and and ecosystems um, after like major impactful stressors um, and I thought this was a really nice beautiful article uh, where they um, the scientists went into World War II damaged islands um, that were kind of a paradise before uh, and if maybe fungi could help restore them so um, Re researchers ventured to the world's most remote islands to study how fungi and soils could help to revive damaged ecosystems. Um, so, uh, yeah, it starts like, you know, the, how the scientist, um, evolutionary biologist Toby Kears, uh, smelling this organic rich soil that has developed in patches around the islands. And um, Kears, um, she is at the Free University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands and had traveled around the globe to hunt for fungi on the North Pacific Atoll of Palmyra, one of the most remote islands on the planet. And she was looking at tree roots uh, to find symbiotic microorganisms called 
mycorrhizae, which form networks of filaments that help plants to absorb nutrients, which form uh, networks uh, um, um, absorb nutrients and water from the soil. They may also be a key part of the process that breaks down coral rubble on land into the peaty soil she found in some locations on Palmyra. Um, Kiris has sampled soil microbes worldwide, but her trip to Palmyra in November 2022 was the first time she had taken her search to an island. She is one of the several researchers exploring whether below-ground microorganisms such as microcia could, how, could be key to restoring heavily degraded ecosystems on these and other islands. Um, so Palmyra's 42 low-lying islets are home to some of the most pristine coral reefs in the world, but the above water ecosystem has been radically altered, first by 19th century coconut plot plantation that introduced invasive palm trees and then by the US military which degraded uh, areas to create airstrips during the Second World War. And now the atoll is uninhabited except for rotating casts of researchers testing how to repair degraded ecosystems. The non-profit global environmental organization the Nature Conservancy TNC brought Palmyra f uh, bought Palmyra for 30 million in 2000 and later sold part to the US government. The atoll is co-managed by TNC and the US and Fish Wildlife Service. The two organizations along with Island Conservation, a California-based nonprofit organization, have spent four million to eradicate rats in the past decade and are now in the middle of a 3.5 million effort to regenerate the rainforest there. <coughs> Palmyra could be a test case for restoring atolls in, uh, and island ecosystems more broadly. Islands are some of the most imperiled, highly disturbed ecosystems in the world and are home to roughly 20% of Earth biodiversity, endemic species that evolved in isolation and exist nowhere else. Most efforts to restore island ecosystems um, have focused on removing invasive species. But since 2020, the organization has been replanting native plant species in the hope that a healthier forest could help make uh, the coral reefs resilient to rising sea temperatures and increasingly acidic waters. Native trees are part of a complex web that connects life on land and in the water. Pisonia grandis or bird catcher trees are one of the native species that uh, lure seabirds to the atoll as bird guano collects around the gnarled roots and fills the soil with nutrients, soil microbes regulate their flow from the land to the sea, nourishing the reefs over time. The plan is to replant pea grandis to restore the island's health, but those efforts have so far met with limited success. A similar story is playing out elsewhere. Many restoration efforts around the world have faltered in their attempts to re-establish native species. Holly Jones, a restoration ecologist at Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, and her colleagues conducted a meta-analysis of 400 restoration projects worldwide and found that although the study ecosystems are recovering, they rarely, they rarely do so completely, and many projects do not do better than letting ecosystems recover on their own. That's where the fungi might come in, says <coughs> Kears. Um, and she is also the director of Society uh, for the Protection of Underground Networks, an initiative of MAP fungal networks. They might be crucial for the health of pigranus and a native shrub, um, both of which provide a dense canopy that birds prefer to nest in. Kiers is convinced that the mycorrhiza play a pivotal role um, part in the cycling of the bird guano's nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium on land. With birds and mycorrhizae, the trees are making their own soil, she says. So working out how to improve the success rate for this ecological repair is a high priority during the United Nations Decades on Ecosystem Restoration. And um, this initiative is running until 2030 and calls on nations to deliver on their commitment to restore a total of more than 1 billion hectares, an area 
uh, the size of China, the cost of global terrestrial restoration, in excluding marine ecosystems, is estimated to be at least 200 billion per year. Until... Hey, Catherine, can you repeat yeah. that, that, that China thing? You said something was almost the size of China? I, yeah, I that's it. what the initiative, you know, lately the UN, they did a lot of really like really high impactful um, resolutions like contracts between nations. One was to save a large amount of ecosystems of the ocean itself and to clean it out of plastics like that was signed by all these nations. And this one is one that to restore um, different ecosystems of the size of China in total. So it was a huge success this year, like to get these nations sign off for this. That's wild, because that is so much like area. Yeah, the ocean one was really, you know, was really amazing. And actually one of our guest speakers was one of the scientists were crucial to his studies that made it really convincing about um, his research of you know coral reefs and uh, coral reefs and, and different ecosystems and how climate change is, is changing those I forget the name of the recording right now but I'll look it up it's you know it was a very positive result of research and science for once <laughs> like that people listened <laughs> it was amazing um yeah please go ahead so I, I was just about to say like I, i've been uh in some of the rooms i i've been in lately it seems like there's a, a growing population of people who uh feel that like science has like disconnected us from nature and i was just thinking like when you kind of develop methods to uh kind of restore or to try to restore uh, nature by using things found in nature versus like you know what I'm saying like just that we're gonna leave this alone like like I feel like that's like a, a really progressive thing you know what I'm saying like how many times like 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 you have like situations where people they'll recognize like diversity in like certain plant groups is going down so they'll like try and get like seeds from it and store it for however long they can store it for you know what I'm saying versus well what's what was here in this environment? How do we fix this so that all the things that are there are there again so that the environment can like fix itself? That's like, to me, that's pretty progressive. Yeah, I agree. And, um, oh, please go ahead, Victoria. Go ahead. go ahead. I'll go after you. Yeah, I think, you know, I agree that science before kind of led us away from being connected, like not all, uh, science, you know, there were ecologists and so on, climate scientists and so on, all the, you know, through all times and, you know, that collected or, you know, but, you know, gave us knowledge about all these different ecosystems and, and, and so on. But the largely applied scientific results kind of made us being disconnected. But I think that the trend at least currently is you know f a lot of scientists to be more aware of the system they are in what people actually want from them um, we had like several speakers here of all kinds of different fields that said that and that they see themselves as a service basically for the system they live in and the, the, the system they want to study and, and serve at the same time. I think there's a little bit of a change in mentality that they are not gods basically changing how they think um, it should be, but a more careful approach, just like the climate uh, scientist about the Arctic and the rivers that was just here, he kept saying... You no, know, we were kind of more pushing, oh, but couldn't we do this? And couldn't this mean this? And he said, no, we need to be more careful, you know, than making quick assumptions and making quick hypotheses. 
and we need to be, you know, things ecosystems restore really well by themselves if you leave them you know i think this change or the genetic uh, team that looked at um you know burial sites in different places in the u.s and ask first the people the locals what do they want to learn from this burial sites and the genetic data and and just do that i think this mentality changed and that's why maybe people are listening more. I don't know. I hope that's that's the case. You know, it just kind of dawned on me, like, uh, if, if, like, this, like, idea works, I'm kind of curious on, like, if, like, fungus should be, like, implemented on, like, future, like, terraforming missions, like, where there's, like, uh, like a region of, uh, of, like, you know, like, kind of, like, just dried out land not necessarily desert or even like another planet you know what i'm saying like once you get like stable like what like precipitation like you probably want to start with like a lichen or something after you get like bacteria there and then maybe like a fungus maybe the next best thing yeah i agree because basically the study said it increased species numbers by where they kind of had a higher occurrence of fungi by 30 percent uh, that bounced back like of, of species diversity which is kind of huge um, and um, there's an and they say there's an estimate of 40 to 50 thousand different species that uh, that kind of form the symbiosis with plants and that we still need to map them and then and then assess which ones you know are good for where in which environment so i think we still have a lot to learn but i think life on earth without you know without fungi it won't work and i guess if we terraform anywhere we need to bring them along and and uh and hopefully they will collaborate what um you had brought up kirko about the attitude of of people with respect to science <clears throat> excuse me it's what I what I see overarching this and going back to to uh, the science of ecology. It's all about relationships, and then Katarina brought up addressing indigenous populations where people are already have have their their timeless wisdom, and what the a trend that I hope will isn't isn't new but will expand is the idea of systems and that's when people um, are looking at an area for example if you're looking at a tree now science is recognizing even though this isn't new and it's certainly not new to indigenous people that that there is this microbiome that is created by the mycorrhizae and that the you've got the fungus you've got your tree roots if it, what i'm saying is that if something's underground and we don't see it then people don't pay it any heed but this underground relationship is responsible for the life of what's above ground and the mycorrhizae are both inside of the tree roots and external they wrap around them and so they're not only providing them nutrients, but they're allowing trees to communicate with each other through these complex fungal networks. And so, depending on what people are putting on the soil or where they're moving a plant to, you could destroy that, that network because the fungi depend on the tree. So clear cutting, for example, and as you know, was happening on this island, when it was raised to create air um, landing strips, that destroyed in certain areas the fungal, the the whole, the whole microbiome that existed there. So it will be really interesting to see as this article progresses, but just in the future, how much it can be artificially enhanced. Yeah. That 
if we can reintroduce it. Yeah, they mm -hmm. also mentioned a negative one that people did before because they, you know, they found, oh, fungi help. So let's just introduce them to the Galapagos Islands. And they did, but because they weren't studying, you know, all these 50,000 different ones and where they are located, they just introduced, you know, some that they knew of and they then kind of helped the invasive species more than the native species. So it did kind of the opposite, though it didn't restore the, the native species environment that, you know, helped grow the invasive species even more. So you kind of have to study the differences in these systems more and then introduce the right one. Yeah, well, absolutely. It's, it's respect. It's, you know, it's, it's just a matter of leaving the ego out and saying, we don't know what's going on here, but we need to respect the system and figure out what the system is. And just because we understand, okay, mycorrhizae are important and there's, you know, this microbiome exists that we didn't know about. But, um, you know, it's like feeding one animal in one mammalian animal, the milk of another mammalian animal, and expecting everything to be completely wonderful. It's just there's there's so many um, you know micronutrients and relationships that that we have to even just express that we don't know what they are. Yeah, and then they keep men then after they mentioned that um, they shown that islands with more uh, seabirds so if you know the right native plants are there they attract the seabirds that are local from that area and the more seabirds there are and um, they kind of um, give the nutrients um, to the fish and uh, and that also then kind of made the coral reefs um, thrive um, again in those regions. So it's really interesting that, you know, so they said that restoring that natural nutrient flow kind of helped the coral reefs uh, indirectly because they are kind of the source of nutrients, those seabirds. So it's really interesting how this whole system is really interconnected and how everything plays a really important part. I was going to Joyce. say that this has made me think about, um, I actually started out in ecology and systems and complexity, and that was the focus of my PhD. And, and I remember at that time, uh, Fritjof Capra came out with a book, The Tao of Physics. And I thought that was fascinating. I liked it. But I thought it was really interesting because a few years later, he came up with another book. And I was just looking to remind me of the name of it. And it was called The Turning Point. And it was all about his uh, marveling about systems theory and systems thinking and the web of life. And I think later on, he became much more focused on that. I mean, the Tao of physics, you know, physics is great, but but complexity and relationships and, and all that uh, is, is, um, was always a great interest of mine. And it was interesting to see how he, he did that evolution. <laughs> and I put his, uh, a Wikipedia article about him in the chat if you're interested. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Michael, did you want to say something in Victor? No, I think it's a fun conversation. I actually was just talking to one of our people on our team about something very similar in this. So, um, it's kind of complicated how it all works, um, but it's, it's beautiful and it's amazing how everything's tied together. Um, so if you look at like a giant forest and you see tall trees and small trees, small trees get no light, right? They need nutrients. They need sunlight. And um, if they don't get sunlight, they die. That's how oxygen is made. But the big trees actually share nutrients through the roots with 
the little trees. I'm just trying to simplify it. I'm not going to go into like the complicated part of it. Yeah, we but were just we were just talking about this. Thank you. I mean, we this is this is the established part of our of the article that we were um, going over previously just to, oh, I'm to sorry. save you. But I yeah, no no problem, but go ahead and yeah, share what you, if you had a point, then we are we we understand the um, the functioning of the forest and and that and the relationships therein, um, and but we had, w would be so happy to hear the point that you are about to make. No, it's just about like how everything's connected, and um, it all works together. You know, without um, you know fungi, we wouldn't have soil. Um, you know, the Earth was rocks billions of years ago, and the fungi broke down the rocks, and everything in the soil um, comes from things that are broken down so the fungi from other things how it breaks down the roots how all of that stuff uh it just intertwines it's it's pretty incredible um i'm not the guy to probably explain it i have great people on my team that do um but we actually were working on our project with um, a country in africa today and that was part of the discussion of like okay well here's a roadblock how do we fix that and solve that and so i had to reach out to someone be like, what can we do here? And like, what's our solution? And instead of spending a month on it, we're like, no, like, I'm like, I want to solve it today. And we figured out a solution, which is pretty cool. So um, yeah, it all it all ties together. And it's, it's incredible. So I'm just, I'm just happy to be in the room. I love it. I'm just gonna listen. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Michael. And um... Yeah, we are all happy to share our science backgrounds and our love of science, and that's the goal of this space, really, is to remove barriers to science for people who are interested. And um, so thank you for being here. Katarina, I was just going to ask you if you wanted to um, head back into the article and share more of it. Um, yeah, I think most, you know, we shared then, you know, the article went on about saying how important it is to study those little different islands um, more specifically and be careful what to basically how to how to restore them to not bring in the wrong um, you know the wrong fungi the wrong plants everything but if it's successful um, the, the, the recent five-year study and it's um, if you want to look into the actual uh, scientific papers, they are listed in the end, showed that if you're successful, you can restore the diversity, the coral reefs um, become healthier again, the seabirds um, come back. Um, so there is a way, if there's a will, to, to save, but we need to, you know, be careful and study systems um you know more carefully and that's why it's wonderful that they have this foundation that supports this kind of more careful um study approach um and you know not just one solution fits all kind of approach that we are moving away from that and i think we are moving a little bit away from that in all kinds of systems in medicine and ecosystems um you know on all different levels which I think is is wonderful. And then the interconnectedness also that was mentioned, I think, yeah, it's really important that we kind of realize, you know, our, as we talked before, our common, what we have in common, how everything is connected, how we are dependent on everything, kind of the whole world system. <laughs> so, um, I think there is no real, you know, being disconnected is very unrealistic. So for the future to move on to have like a viable earth for everyone. So uh, I think the more we are aware of it and the more we, we keep sharing this and approaching problem solving that way, the better. I see, Euro, did you want to make a comment? We are about to close the room but uh feel free to add something a thought maybe a question 
Um, thanks so much. No, I'll just uh, thank you guys. I, en I enjoyed listening, and I, I'm a big fan of science news, so uh, I was glad that you did this room. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, it's always nice uh, to hear, and it's always wonderful when different people from different backgrounds come and join the conversation because it adds on different viewpoints that um, we wouldn't have thought of before. So yeah, feel everyone, thank you for participating, commenting, asking questions, uh, viewpoints that kind of elicit really interesting discussions along the way. Of course, Victoria, for sharing your really cool articles again <laughs> today and Kirko for those really interesting thoughts how to apply uh, those different technologies. You have really always interest, really creative and interesting ideas. And yeah, I hope you'll enjoy it, your week. Uh, we'll talk again um, on June 27th. We have Dr. Okre um, coming, uh, presenting his research about multi-sensory learning and how it binds neurons in a cross-modal memory engram and kind of improves memory um, formation and how that works uh, will be i think a really interesting talk and then we have the science newsrooms uh, keep we keep going on with these throughout the summer but then the guest speaker events will kind of be way less usually we have like around two uh, a week uh we'll have again one in we'll have a couple in july um dr logan will talk about risk of isolation increases the expected burden for a sea level rise uh you will um we will see if you know um it's it's about different populations and 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 if the the population there is more isolated type of a city small towns and so on um, how that uh, increases their risk of um, surviving basically with the future sea level rises and how to to um, you know make those um, cities and so on more viable in the future more resilient and then, um, yeah, we'll have another brain tuning exploration um, with Dr. Pinozis. He is a really interesting researcher. He does a lot of uh, modeling, machine learning for neuroscience. And he, he did, like, he is working on a really wonderful one that um, you can basically try out on his model. It became, you know, they use so much data and um, uh, collaborated with a lot of uh, different uh, groups that you can really use their model to test if a drug or some intervention you use uh, for mental health or, you know, also for um, secretary systems <coughs> can predict basically how useful or the, how the outcome would be on a, you know, real life brain. So basically create a model system for a real life brain and how drugs and different interventions would, what the outcome would be. And I think this is really important. Victoria and I discussed this. I don't think this researcher has it in mind, but, you know, we read a bunch of articles with human trials and there's always the placebo group that gets the short stick of an end and the short stick might is sometimes fatal if not many times depending on how severe the illness is so the better the models will become that we can simulate I think the more humane the future clinical trials can be designed hopefully so I'm really excited about him coming and he already offered to collaborate also with me for the mental health uh, studies I'm doing. So yeah, he's really nice. I think it will be a wonderful room 
in July. So this was a very broad <laughs> future um, introduction of our little future. But um, I think, you know, it's exciting and it's always nice to share in part of a future that's exciting. So enjoy the rest of your day, morning, evening, wherever you are. And um, bye, everyone. And thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And also, I, it's great, even um, as you did Euro, just to come up and say hello. We welcome that so much because this room is, is for everybody. We could just talk amongst ourselves, but that's not really our idea. So thank you for making it more collaborative. And is, there, is there yeah, a way to suggest, oops, sorry. Yes. Is there, is there a way to suggest like new topics? Sure, you can back channel either of us. You can put something in the room chat. We're happy to hear. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Go for it. Thank you. We're all about collaboration. Um, can I have a quick share before you close? Please. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Um, go ahead. <laughs> thank you so much, Victoria and Katarina. I can't thank you enough. I uh, just monitored the um, out of curiosity, monitored the stats of this room in the last few weeks, and the growth is amazing. I will send you the stats with figures and the graphs. I'm using uh, <laughs> uh, public hub. Uh, clubhouse and the room ranking in the top 10 of the world every single week so i thought i will share with you those news and tell you before you monetize your segment it's amazing and it's creating a lot of attention so keep doing what you're doing because you're teaching us all how to thrive in clubhouse thank you oh wow thank you for doing that i didn't do that and um... Um, thank you so much, Dr. I will Hayden, send you the figures. I will send you the figures. You can publish oh, wow, a paper yeah. out of it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I mean, thank you for sharing that. It's interesting how many people actually, you know, are willing to listen to like you know, real science and uh, speak like you know our speakers that are sharing you know the real hard science and. How many people are actually interested in that? And if we can show that not, you know, not just to promote us, but to tell people out there that are doing all these, you know, YouTube videos and whatnot, you know, people are also interested in this type of content. Please make more of it, everyone, and not just bullshit. Maybe that could also be the message. So thank you, Dr. Heidi. Yeah, I think we hopefully with that will motivate more people to to create content like this and not just, you know, whatever nonsense sometimes is out there. So thank you. Okay, on that very happy note, uh, I'll close the room in three, two, one. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.